Hello, hello, hey there, hey there. Welcome to another Achievers exclusive. I'm Josh Ellis, Editor-in-Chief of Success Magazine, and my guest today is Dennis Waitley. He's a legend in the personal development space. He has positively affected the lives of millions of people through his writing and speaking. He's the founding director of the National Council on Self-Esteem, and he's been inducted into the International Speakers Hall of Fame. His latest book, it's a follow-up to one of his all-time classics, is the new psychology of winning, top qualities of a 21st century winner. Dennis, it's really an honor to have the chance to speak to you. Thanks for being here. Well, thank you very much. It's great to be with you. So congrats on the new book. Um, I was thrilled to receive my copy, um, courtesy of your friend Eli Marcus. Tell us about it. Why did you write this one? Well, of course, it's a, a 43-year-old sequel to the old one. So it took, it's like Rocky number 43, but it took me 43 years to, to do it. I wrote this one because, and I wrote it during the pandemic and during the early stages. And it was an interview, 18 hours on the phone and tried to get the concise thoughts. But I thought it was time to go from uh, the old winning to the new winning, which has been the delivery system in the digital age. So back when I wrote The Psychology of Winning, there was no internet. And so we communicated in a very different way. We dove deep and long and long videos and long books. And now it's more concise, more instant. And therefore I wrote it because I thought we should bring winning up into the digital age. A lot's changed and a lot hasn't. Well, let's start with what hasn't. You've been around a long time. Um, I know that a lot of the things that you taught in your earliest days, years in this field are still absolutely translatable today. So what are, what are some of those um, items about the psychology of winners that are completely timeless? Well, I think the timeless ones are that <clears throat> your potential, your belief in yourself, when you believe in your dreams, when that's all you have to hang on to, that gives you the motivation to believe that you have potential. So first you have to believe you have potential. And so you have to believe in your own self-worth, that you're worthy of educating, changing, growing, and contributing. If you believe in your potential, that gives you a passport to take the journey. You won't take the journey unless you feel you're deserving and you can get there. That hasn't changed. A winning used to be standing over a fallen adversary and being number one. I think it's still competitive. I think we still have the competitive winning game trying to see how good you are against a world-class standard. And that would be typical of the Olympic Games. You go to the Olympics to go against world-class standards, but not necessarily to beat someone, but to see how good you are against excellence. That hasn't changed. I think we're always striving to see how good we are against the best. So that's the same. I think also taking personal responsibility for the outcome, feeling that you're more in control of the outcome than you thought and that you can make a difference, that you're not just, shall we say, like an animal living by instinct. We have the ability to choose. And I think freedom of choice hasn't changed uh, through the years, although it's a little different now. You know, I was struck by what you said about the... Um... You know, competition being such a driver for so long. And I, I wonder if now, you know, the abundance mindset, talk of the abundance mindset has really developed over, over the decades, whether that has, that sort of thinking has altered the way that, that we view winning and success. You know, I think it's still the same. We, we we're very human. We're very flawed in that way. We want to be the best. We want to be noticed. We want to be relevant. We want to be somebody, you know, it's like a, an athlete says, I'm not a role model. I'm an entertainer. No, you're a role model because so many people want to look like you, play like you, earn like you, and be like you. So we, we pick role models who are highly competitive and highly successful. I don't think that's changed, but I think we're more inclusive now in that we, we're opening ourselves up for more people being able to classify themselves as successful and winners. But uh, there's a caveat in there that we can also talk about. Even though I don't think winning has changed that much, I think uh, immediate gratification is is uh, with us more. And I think people want uh, 
an app for success rather than to take the, the long journey? Well, that was my next question is, is some of the items that need updating in the 21st century um, and, and with the advancement of technology. And we just live in like an on-demand world, right? And so it's, it's natural that people expect these kind of shortcuts. That's never been the way it has worked uh, for success. Or well, there's no winning. question. And, and uh, you know, I'm from the old school, so it's taken me a long time. I'm roadkill on the information highway. I thought a funnel was something that Dorothy went up to the Wizard of Oz with, but a funnel is, is a one-time offer, do it for free, get them in, escalating values, make sure you sell them quick, engage Facebook. And on Amazon, you can be a bestseller with only 10 books sold. So everyone has the ability to be number one, I'm the best, and on social media, you can create your own image not, not necessarily your character, but what's changed is the immediacy, the ability to transmit information so rapidly that everyone has it on the fly. We see what's happening in the world in an instant way, both good and bad. So one thing that worries me though, is that technology, while it's the most marvelous thing I've ever seen, enabling us to talk to people we could never talk to, close to our grandchildren we might not see, the ability to engage globally, fantastic. But the other side of that is that Facebook is not face-to-face, -face, although we think it is, Instagrams. And so they're, the senses are not as involved today and we're more with avatars and virtual selves. And so the intimacy of a relationship is not as face-to-face -face and, and touching with the senses. And we tend to, to make that up with a, being tethered to our cell phone. The good news is we have the ability to reach to everyone. The bad news is except to touch them physically. You know, one thing that I know is so important to you is optimism. And speaking of that technological chain change, you know, the, the way we live, the standard of living across the world uh, has risen for the better over the decades and, and over the centuries. This is the human story, right? Things have always gotten a little easier and a little better. Um, and yet I think that we live at a time now where a lot of people aren't sure if the future is brighter. What do you, what do you say to them? I think that that's true. And I think that's a problem because, first of all, optimism is the biology of hope. And the world belongs to the optimist where the pessimists clean up the locker room and the optimists get the interviews. But the optimists see the solution. The pessimists dwell on the problem. And one of the problems with that is if you keep bringing up the problem and become part of it, let's say that you protest only against what's wrong, and we see what's wrong instantly today everywhere. So it's very easy to get caught in the trap of, wow, things are worse than I thought they were. And the pandemic hasn't helped because we've been socially distancing. We've, we've had all these fear things that have happened but I think optimism is one of the single most important things because it enables you to be grateful for what you have rather than always be striving for what you don't have. And if you can take stock of what you do have and be grateful for it and try to be part of the solution instead of part of the problem, it's so easy to be a critic, so difficult to be a role model. And for, for me at my age, I'm 88 years old, uh, I want to live to be 100, actually, because I want to see how it unfolds. Uh, I have a lot to do with my great-grandchildren. I have a teenage great-granddaughter. And when, when your grandson has a teenager, then you know the bird of time is on the wing. And she says, Papa, uh, who was, is it, was, was it Elvis Prosley, Prusley, Michael Johnson? I said, Michael Jackson, yes, yes. And uh, Paul, Paul Newt. Newbert Newman, New Newman, that's it. So she would, she doesn't know anyone that I knew and that's only been, you know, 40 years. So I'm looking at the new generation. She says, well, I can help you set up your smartphone too. I noticed you're a little slow. So I'm watching the new generation and they're, they are so quick and they're so smart and they're, and they're so with this little smartphone, they have, they have the world up in their hand, at their fingertips, they have access. But on the other hand, for me, I wish we could just slow it down a little bit and say, you know, 
you want to talk a little while? Do you want to explain what your big why is in life? So we're moving very, very fast and maybe too fast in some ways. But, you know, I'm an optimist. And so I believe that even though we may have swung uh, to quick fixes and to instant gratification a little more than I'd like to see, I still think we're going to come back more centered and realize how grateful we have for what we have. And like you said earlier, Josh, you said uh, people don't realize how the standard of living throughout the world has risen and how, how thankful we are to have the technology, the medicine. What we have is so amazing based upon what everyone before us did. We should be grateful for what we have and then try to be part of the difference rather than part of the problem. I've got to think because it, it, I knew this would happen um, it, it, when I, you know, was preparing for the interview that I would, I would find myself like just sort of in awe of uh, someone who um, as, as you've aged, you continue to contribute. You're 88 years old and you just put out another book um, and you're not jaded. Whereas some of the older people that I know in my life uh, have gotten that way and withdrawn um, so, so how does one, what has been, you know, important for you to sort of age well or, or gracefully or however you might think of it? Well, I think I learned a lot from Warren Buffett when I was watching an interview and he said, uh, they said, you're going to give away all your stock. And he said, yes. And they said, well, are you retiring? He said, no, I love being on the field. I love being in the game. I love helping people. I love getting up, making my bed and going to work. Even though, like Warren Buffett, I'm in overtime rather than the fourth quarter. So when you're 88, every day, every moment is exquisite. And you're not sure what, how many moments you have. So what you've learned is to be in the moment rather than living for the moment. Instead of striving to get to this ethereal top, you need to smell the roses every day and you need to be doing things you love. And so what I do, I hang around young people. I try to help young people and it keeps me younger because they're moving, they're creative, they're off the wall and I'm trying to keep up with it. And it keeps me young to be always getting up in the morning saying, okay, what can I do with this day to make some life breathe easier? And it could be a dog. It could be an animal, a squirrel, a bird, a plant, a tree. But I wake up every day saying, you've given me this part of this day so far. So I'm going to get out of bed and make something good happen. And I think that I've learned from Warren Buffett. If he's going to work every day when he doesn't need to, and he loves going to work, and he's in overtime at age 90, I'm in overtime at age 88. So most of my classmates at Annapolis are gone. So I'm one. So... Just, just for reference, there were 750 of us graduated in my year, and there are only about 80 of us left. So out of the 700 and something college graduates, there are a few of us still around. Bill Anders, Apollo 8, who orbited the moon, was my classmate, and we went to Annapolis together on the bus. And I look at people who are engaged and involved, and they seem to live longer if they have a goal and a why. So it's my why that I want to live to see what happens in my grandchildren, my great grandchildren. And I want to help people. And I think that keeps me alive. One of my favorite interviews that I've done over the years is with a guy named Dan Butner, who wrote for uh, National Geographic and, and a couple of books uh, studying the people who live the longest in the world uh, in these pockets of like Costa Rica and um, all, uh, an island off the coast of Greece that have the highest concentration of people that live to be a hundred. And it's absolutely what you said. They felt purpose and they felt needed by the community. Um, what was your, as a younger man, your journey with, with feeling uh, purpose? My father left when I was nine. And, but he did go into World War II, and my mother worked in an aircraft factory. But my grandmother and I planted a victory garden. And she planted the seeds of greatness in me, telling me that whatever we put in the ground and nurtured would come up. And I said, wow, but what happens with weeds? She said, they don't need watering. They blow in every day. And I said, why do weeds not need watering and plants do? She said, you're a gardener, and you'll never get it right. 
but I want you to model yourself after people who've given service to the world and made a difference, not to be rich and famous, but to, to feel that you've made a difference. And I think I got that about age nine to 14 from my grandmother during World War II. And remember, I was sitting there when President Roosevelt said yesterday, December 7th. So I was eight years old when Pearl Harbor was attacked. So I've been around long enough to have seen polio and viruses and wars and cold wars and so on. So I'm, I'm beginning to realize that everything I thought as a little boy, seeds of greatness planted in me by model myself after people who have been contributing, making a difference, having that why. And I got my why from my grandma. And so that's why I wrote about her in one of my books. So I'm an absolute optimist. Uh, if somebody says it's raining, I say it's good for the flowers. If somebody says it's hot, I said it's a good day for the beach. It's good for the flowers. So I'm trying to find something good in all the dark clouds that we see. And so people ask me today, they say, what do you think about this horrible situation in the world? And I said, I'm so grateful for my family and to be part of it. Isn't it wonderful that we have a chance to make a difference? So I haven't changed, I'm not Pollyanna because you know I've been a, a Navy pilot being catapulted off a carrier in the middle of the night. So I had a career as a Navy pilot, but that was because the Korean War was upon us and we had to serve the country but I would have anyway. But you wouldn't call me a conservative and you wouldn't call me a liberal. You'd call me a guy that votes his conscience and his heart. And uh, instead of hating anybody, I'm loving the things that are good. So I do not have an ounce of hate or recrimination or resentment, not one. And I don't have an ego either. I left that at the door a long time ago because people with an ego or hiding a lightly valued self, if they have to trumpet their success, then they're calling for help. But if you're helping other people, you're gonna attract people. And so I'd rather be modest and helpful than feel that I'm the center of the universe. You mentioned social media earlier. And, and when you talk about people needing to trumpet their success, uh, coming with an ego, I mean, it's sort of a reality in business these days, especially for solopreneurs. If you're a real estate agent or independent salesperson, um, you know, you have to put yourself out there. And, and you know, I, I, I guess I'm wondering what the silver lining on that cloud is. It, it's social media is, you know, I, I've got to think one of the biggest like societal revolutionary changes that that you've seen it's certainly been in my lifetime so you know i i i wonder how you view it in general and, and what the what the positive of it is and how to how to actually use it for good in our careers or our lives well the positive of course is that that uh in your own room in a garage you can be as powerful as a corporate ceo so you really are the CEO of your own life with social media and that you can broadcast your ideas and content without having to go through the hierarchy. So you really can engage with more people than ever before, regardless of who you are. That's really wonderful. The other thing is you have a chance to self-publish. Uh, you can go on Amazon and certainly taken over the book business. And so you can publish your book, you can self-publish, you can uh, get an audience, you can podcast, you can just keep reaching out and networking like you never could before. And so we're all networkers in that way. That's the good part. The bad part is that, uh, unfortunately, if you're a good salesperson and aggressive, you can say things about yourself and not be fact-checked. So in other words, you can say, uh, I'm a number one Amazon best-selling, you know, I've sold 20 books in different categories. And you can make yourself the greatest and tell people you are. And if you look like it, act like it, be like it, they'll buy in because a lot of people buy the presentation rather than the substance behind it. So you don't necessarily have to have the experience. So what I, my, my son, for example, said, well, I can just go out and give your talk. My name's Dennis Waitley Jr. I said, what happens if somebody asks you a question? He goes, oh, if they ask me a question, then I'll have to, yes, you'll have to have been there, done that, or read it, or studied it. But you can't just put on that you're an expert simply because you project expertise. That's the bad side, is that anyone can be a coach, an expert, a mentor, 
And if you're good at selling, you'll be, you'll make money. So money then becomes a driving force to make money by having other people buy what you're saying. But the people who are making the money are the ones that are presenting. And the people who are buying what they're presenting aren't necessarily making more money because maybe the substance wasn't there, but the hype was. So I think to overpromise and underdeliver should be not regarded well. I think you should underpromise, overdeliver, and walk your talk. And if you have the integrity, then if you're going to coach somebody, you really are going to bring out the best in them based on your experience. You know, as we talk about winning in the 21st century, and especially from a business perspective now. Um, what do you see as the biggest challenges entrepreneurs and solopreneurs will face going forward? And, and maybe along you know, the other side of the coin, what are the biggest opportunities? Well, I think, uh, I think the, the biggest hurdle to an entrepreneur is they, they believe that if you came up with an app, if you could be an Elon Musk, Elon Musk overnight, they see people making so much money so quickly, they think it's really easy to get rich quick. And it's not. It's not easy to get rich quick because you have to give somebody something that has value to them. And so it's not that easy to pick a fad. You have to pick a trend instead of a fad. So I think the difficult thing is which, which direction is life going? What do people need and want that you can provide? What's, what's the differentiation? You have to be really good at picking a trend instead of trying to jump into a fad. So that's difficult for an entrepreneur. And of course, you do need to get capital background behind you. So you have to get people who want to invest in your dream. But I think the good news is you anyone can, if they have a creative idea, find an audience and they can actually be a network. They can be a direct salesperson. Everyone can. You only sell you. You know, the decision of the buyer is based on the value of the seller and the presentation. So I think for an entrepreneur, this is an ideal world because you've got, a, you've got the world. I know more people who are making money in China from the United States than are making money in, in their own community because they've resonated with an audience in a totally different area of the world. And that's, that's exciting to be able to communicate uh, your ideas globally. Just unbelievable opportunity for an entrepreneur, especially in, in communication. If you can save people time and money, you'll have all the time and money that you want because time is the one thing we have the least of and money is the one thing that people would like because they think it gives them freedom, but you can't buy help. That's the other thing John was going to say is that I'm right in the middle of trying to recover from one of the worst cases of throat cancer. And I never smoke. So first of all, you know, I've had different kinds of you know, prostate cancer I had a long time ago and I've had heart issues. A surgeon made a mistake and cut my femoral artery, made a mistake. And there've been these things over the past three years that I'm just recovering from serious throat cancer where they didn't think I was going to make it. And I thought, wow, okay. What I've learned is that when I'm given challenges, that optimism, responsibility, staying with it, persistence, courage, all these things make a motivational speaker like me have to walk my talk. So instead of being the guy that talks about the psychology of winning, my family is watching me to see if I live what I say. And I think that's why it's so important. I'd say the most important thing of all is to be able to stand behind your words with action and not just give people lip service, but, but show them by your behavior who you are. You know, it's so interesting that we arrived at that point naturally because it's really the last question that I wanted to ask. I mean, you've motivated and taught so many people over the years, uh, millions and millions. Um, and I, I wondered what you've learned about yourself along the way. And, and really, it sounds like it was in those moments of uh, difficulty, health, um, that, that you, you know, really showed yourself what you're made of. Well, you know, the most important thing I learned is that I was like everybody else. And I was too busy wanting where I was going and too busy trying to be relevant too busy trying to be significant, 
to realize that the significance of life is by being in the game every moment and trying to live in the moment rather than for the moment. An Olympian doesn't look forward or backward. They're in the moment at the time they're doing it. They have only this one moment in time. And so what I've learned is to take each moment that I'm given and make sure that I get the full experience of that moment because I rushed through the first three quarters of my life trying to catch what was at the end. And what I found was at the end was old age. So, and I found that old age came a lot quicker than I thought. In fact, I was just in high school the other day, at least in my memory. So instead of looking back at what I've done, where I've been, I'm looking forward to where I'm going that gives me motivation, but I'm relishing every moment. And I wish I would have learned earlier to make sure that I was doing every day something that really I loved and wanted rather than waiting and putting on a layaway till the end. For example, if you wanna ski, then do it now because when you're 88, it doesn't work as well. If you wanna scuba dive, do it now when you're 88, you you have shallower water. So don't keep putting your bucket list in the future. Live your bucket a day at a time, a moment at a time, and a week at a time. Don't make this layaway list because if you're not careful, you'll rush through it trying to get there only to find that it was behind you instead of ahead of you. Dennis, we are all richer for your contributions and, and so grateful for all the you know, positive effect you've had on, on millions of people, ourselves included. And, and it's an honor to, to have the chance to talk to you today. Well, thank you very much. And I, I really am serious uh, about saying that we need success magazine in whatever form it reaches you and delivered, because we need in one place where we can get the best that will help us remain optimistic, be in charge of our lives and see, shall we say, where we can go instead of where we are. Thank well, you. Success wouldn't be where it is today without uh, without people like you uh, being, a, being a part of, of our story over the years. So thank you for for uh, being a longtime friend of the magazine and now on Achievers. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. To all of thank you who joined us today, thank you so much. We'll be back next week. So long, everybody. Thank you.